Let's just have a word of prayer. Dear Father in heaven, we thank you for your incredible love. We thank you that there is no one else quite like you. Lord, you're, you're greater and more amazing than anything we can possibly think of or imagine. And Lord, as we, we open your word today, I pray that, that you would um, give me your words, Lord, and may your spirit anoint this message. May it be you speaking to us um, through me. And may every person leave with a special message and being more committed to you is my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Turn with me in your Bibles to John chapter 18 and verse 12. It was Jesus' last night with his disciples. And they went down to one of their favorite places, to a garden called Gethsemane, just outside the walls of Jerusalem. And after they had been there for a couple of hours... Um, Judas, the twelfth disciple, the absent disciple, made his way down to the, to the garden as well. But Judas was not alone. With Judas was this band of soldiers, religious leaders, people who were angry, people who were after Jesus. And they had weapons, they had torches, because it was late in the night, and they were there for Jesus. And we pick it up in verse 12, and it says, So the band of soldiers and their captain and the officers of the Jews arrested Jesus and bound him. This is, that's John chapter 18, verse 12. The disciples had always felt safe with Jesus. Jesus had done unbelievable miracles. When someone was sick, Jesus would, would heal them. When someone was hungry, he would, he would pray over um, loaves and fish, and he would feed a multitude. When someone was demon-possessed, he would just say a word, and the demons would leave. When they were out on the lake in the storm, a word to the wind and the waves, and it was still. Whatever danger, whatever difficulty the disciples came across, Jesus always had an answer. Jesus was always able to help them to get through. But this night, something was different. The angry mob came up and they arrested Jesus. They bound him. One of the disciples pulled out his sword and he tried to fight. But Jesus, he rebuked the disciple. And he healed the the, the man's ear who he had chopped off. The disciples, they were confused. They suddenly felt vulnerable. They were terrified and they began to panic. And they fled for their lives. James, he fled. Thomas, he fled. Matthew, he ran off as well. All of the disciples except for two of them. In John chapter 18, verse 15, we pick it up. And it says, John chapter 18, verse 15 says, Simon Peter followed Jesus and so did another disciple. Two disciples followed in Jesus' steps. The first one was Peter. Now, earlier in that night, Peter had had a very tense conversation with Jesus. Jesus had told Peter that before the rooster would crow, he would deny him three times. But Peter, he knew differently, and so he protested against Jesus. He said, Jesus, you think this is going to happen, but you don't realize how committed I am to you. Even if I have to go to prison and to death, Jesus, I will never deny you. And so Peter still, this, this conversation was probably still fresh in his mind, and when they arrested Jesus and dragged him off, Jesus, um, Peter thought, I'm going to show Jesus just how committed I am, and I'm going to follow him as well. The second person is simply called another disciple. Now, we have good reason to believe that this is the Apostle John, the author of the gospel where he wrote this, because throughout the gospel, John often refers to himself in an indirect way like this, whether it's the disciple that Jesus loved or another disciple. And so we see the angry mob takes Jesus and Peter and John are following behind. Let's read the rest of verse 15. It says, Simon Peter followed Jesus and so did another disciple. Since that disciple was known to the high priest, he entered with Jesus into the court of the high priest. So this angry mob going through the darkness, they arrive at the house of the high priest. And when they get there, it says that John entered with Jesus. Why did, why did John enter the courtyard? It says there in the verse, it says, because he was known by the high priest. Now, this is a significant point. When John walked into the courtyard of the high priest's house, there is no indication that he tried to conceal his identity at all. He went in unashamed to being a disciple of Jesus. He went in as an open Christ follower. But this was not so with Peter. Let's read verse 16. It says, But Peter stood outside at the door 
And so the other disciple, who was known to the high priest, went out and spoke to the servant girl who kept watch at the door and brought Peter in. Peter stood outside the door, it says. Why was he outside the door? The reason I believe he was outside the door was because, remember, he had just chopped off the servant of the high priest's ear. Do you think he wanted to follow closely to those people? It wouldn't make much sense. And so Peter was probably, he was following because he was committed and he had told Jesus he was committed to him, but he was probably following at a bit of a distance, not wanting to be too close to the crowd. And so when he arrives at the door of the courtyard, he was too late. And so he is outside. But John comes, the other disciple, who's known to the high priest. He comes and he convince, convinces this servant girl to let Peter come in the door. Now, as Peter goes through that door, he has a choice to make. Peter has to decide, will he go in? Will he just hang out with the other disciple, John? Because they knew who John was. Will he just hang out with him and and be known as a disciple? Or will he do something different? Will Will John try and mix into the background? Will he try to conceal his identity? Will he try to just simply fade in? Will he be either an open Christ follower or will he be an undercover Christ follower? Kind of like when you see those, those movies and the, the policeman goes undercover in, into the, the enemy territory and, and, they, and they try to talk like, they try to look like the enemy, the, the people that the criminals are trying to catch and they have to do whatever they can do to sort of conceal their identity. Would Peter go in as an open Christ follower or as an undercover Christ follower? Verse 17 reveals the decision that Peter made. It says, The servant girl at the door said to Peter, You also are not one of this man's disciples, are you? And he said, I am not. Peter, when he comes to that point of decision, and the girl at the door says, Are you one of Jesus' disciples? What does he say? I am not. Peter made the decision to go undercover. But there's more to this story, and we're going to go back to um, Luke chapter 22. Because this story um, is, is in the different Gospels, it gives slightly different accounts of this story, and when we piece them together, we get a fuller picture of what exactly happened. So Luke chapter 22 and verse 54. It says, Then they seized him and led him away, bringing him into the high priest's house. And Peter was following at a distance, and we've already talked about some reasons why Peter was probably at that distance. 55, it says, And when they had kindled a fire in the middle of the courtyard and sat down together, Peter sat down among them. And so Peter, when he finally gets into the house, he's kind of trying to mix in amongst the the angry mob, trying to mix and fade into the background. And the people there, because it's the middle of the night, the coldest time of the night, they start to kindle a fire. And the, and the people sort of circle around the fire, and, and Peter thinks, maybe if I, sh- I could maybe just take my place around the fireplace, and they won't really know who I am. And so he does that, and he sits with the, with the soldiers and the mob around the fireplace. Verse 56, it says, Then a servant girl, seeing him as he sat in the light, and looking closely at him, said, This man also was with him. So remember, it's the middle of the night. So when Peter walked in, it's dark. And so they might not have been able to see him very clearly. But when he sits around the circle around the fireplace, the light from the fire flickers and it lights up his face. And when that happens, suddenly the girl recognizes Peter and says, this man also was with him. And suddenly Peter goes from trying to fade into the background to having every one of those eyes around the circle looking directly at him. And he suddenly is the center of attention. All eyes are on Peter. Let's read again from verse 56. It says, Then a servant girl, seeing him as he sat in the light and looking closely at him, said, This man also was with him. Verse 57, But he denied it, saying, Woman, I do not know him. Here, Peter has suddenly forgotten the commitment that he made to Jesus. 
Remember, Jesus had told him that he was going to deny him three times that night. And Peter had assured Jesus, even if I have to go to prison and to death, Jesus, I will not deny you. But now all that he can think about is those eyes that are looking at him around that fireplace. And everyone holds their breath. Everyone's waiting for a response. What will Peter say? And he utters the words, Woman, I do not know him. What had happened? Only hours before, this same Peter was so committed that when the band of soldiers had come, he pulled out this sword. When he was so committed that he was willing to take on a whole crowd of angry armed men. He was so committed that he was willing to risk his life in warfare for his Lord. But this same Peter, who only hours ago was so committed, is now made powerless. Why? Because of the possibility of ridicule, of embarrassment, and of humiliation. And when I think about this story, I realize that in my own life, so many times I have been guilty of this very same thing. I went to a public high school in Port Macquarie, and, so often, and because I was a Christian, I suddenly found my, myself in the minority. And being someone who wanted to fit in, I didn't want to appear to be different, I found myself often going undercover with my Christianity. Being a Christian was, was on a need-to-know basis. Um, one way that this played out, we, they had this new initiative at the school where during roll call, um, every day you had 15 minutes of, of just private reading time. So you could bring in any book that you liked, and you could just simply read that for 15 minutes to encourage the students to read. And I thought, wow, this is a good idea for me to bring my Bible in, and I can spend 15 minutes every day just reading my Bible. And so I remember getting into, into class that day, and I had my Bible in my bag, and I'm sitting down at, my de- at the desk, and the, and the teacher's like, all right, get your books out, time to read. And I'm there, and I'm about to pull my Bible out, and I suddenly start thinking, what's everyone going to think at this school if I suddenly pull my Bible out and start reading it? And looking back, you know, they probably wouldn't have even cared if I did that. But I had worked it up in my own mind that, that maybe these people might make jokes about. I don't know what I thought, but for some reason, I was too embarrassed to pull my Bible out at school that day. And so I was making, through these decisions, I was making a choice to go undercover with my Christianity. But you see, the thing is that when you go undercover with your Christianity, it makes you vulnerable to temptation. Because if, if, you, if no one knows that you're a Christian and you're trying to appear like everybody else, then suddenly everyone expects you to act like everyone else. And so when that point comes, like Peter, when everyone around the circle is looking at him and you're suddenly put on the spot to make a decision for Jesus is a decision that means you'll have to push against the expectations of everyone else in the room. And it makes it so much harder One thing, if I did high school again, that I'd like to be more open about would be the Sabbath. Um, A lot of people had no idea, my friends had no idea about the Sabbath, no idea that I kept the Sabbath. And I remember one time when um, I was in the school band and we're organizing this, this date for this performance and it was on a Saturday. And I didn't realize this until just then. And the teacher started to go right around the classroom and ask us individually, are you going to be there on, for the performance? And he goes, this person, this person, this person, this person, this person. He gets to me, and suddenly all eyes upon me, am I going to be there for the performance? And I tell you what, that's a hard time to bring up the fact that you keep the Sabbath. Another time we were um, planning, I was on this, this little committee that was planning the um, school formal, and they were deciding when they're going to have it, and they, someone said, let's have it Friday night. And they put it to the group, is there any reason why we can't have it on Friday night? And, in, and I'm thinking, there's a reason why I don't want it to be on Friday night. But when I'm put on the spot and no one else knows that you're a, even a Christian, let alone someone who keeps the Sabbath, I tell you what, that's a hard time to, to say, talk about the Sabbath, because you're pushing against the expectations of everyone else in that room. Another way that this played out in my life was in regards to alcohol. I once went to, um, I had a few friends, I hadn't really um, hung out with them very much before, and they asked me if I wanted to go um, sandboarding with them, which is kind of like snowboarding, but on sand dunes. And I was really excited. I was hanging out with these, these new, new people. And at the end, one of them said, oh, come on, guys, just come around to my place, and we'll have a few drinks. 
And I was suddenly just like, whoa, hang on, what's, what's going on here? Um, but they didn't know I was a Christian. It was, and it was so hard to try and work through that situation because to make a decision for Jesus would be to push against the expectations of everyone else, all those other people who were there. But at another experience, when I was at an 18th birthday party, um, a Christ, one of my friends who knew that I was a Christian, knew that I didn't drink, I remember when he offered me to have a drink, suddenly I knew that he expected me to say no because I'd been open about that with him in the past. And so I'll tell you what, it was so much easier for me to say no to him because I didn't have to push against those ex- expectations. In fact, because he expected me to say no, it was actually easier to say no. Um, and so that has been my, my own experience. And so it, it really has taught me that when you go undercover, it makes you so much more vulnerable to temptation because you have to push against the expectations of all those around you. So Peter and John, the two disciples that followed Jesus in to the courtyard of the high priest. When you read this story, what I find interesting is that there is no record of John ever denying Jesus. Did you notice that? Why is it that Peter falls so easily when he was so committed, and yet John doesn't seem to be tempted at all to deny, to deny Jesus? Could it be that John, when he went into that courtyard, he went in as an open disciple as opposed to an undercover one, and that made all of the difference? And so I believe that one of the factors that led to Peter's fall is the fact that he went in undercover. But there is another factor as well, and to discover this, we're going to need to go back into the garden, the Garden of Gethsemane. So turn with me to Mark chapter 14, verse 32. Mark chapter 14, verse 32. And it says, And they went to a place called Gethsemane. And he said to his disciples, Sit here while I pray. So what was the purpose of going to the garden? Prayer. Now did Jesus know that there was Um, great temptations coming up before them? He did. For Jesus, he was about to face the greatest temptation that his his earthly ministry would ever face, the the crucifixion upon Calvary. But for his disciples as well, they were about to um, have some of the greatest temptations that they had faced in their ministry up to this point. And so Jesus took them there for the purpose of prayer. Verse 33, it says, And he took with him Peter and James and John and began to be greatly distressed and troubled. And he said to them, My soul is very sorrowful even to death. Remain here and watch. And going a little farther, he fell on the ground and prayed that if it were possible, that the hour might pass from him. And he said, Abba, Father, all things are possible for you. Remove this cup from me, yet not what I will, but what you will. Jesus knows that he is about to face the cross. And so he is on his knees in prayer and he is pleading with the Father for strength to make it through those trials. But what happens when he comes back and he sees the disciples? In verse 37 it says, And he came and found them sleeping. And he said, Peter, Simon, are you asleep? Could you not watch one hour? So when the disciples are supposed to be praying, they're they're sleeping. And did you notice who Jesus particularly pointed out there? He said, Peter, Simon, are you asleep? Why did Jesus point Peter's name out? Because he knew that Peter was about to deny him, and Peter in particular needed strength through prayer. And then he goes on to say, Watch and pray that you may not enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. What do you think of that phrase there? The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. The way that I understand this is, um, I'll give you you an illustration from a a story of my own. I was at my brother's house maybe uh, four months ago or so, and we decided to go for a run in the morning. Now, my brother had this this, this trail that he he liked to go, which was 10 kilometers, and in the middle of the trail was Mount Gravatt. And so it was this pretty full-on run. Um, And so we we got up early in the morning, put on our running shoes, and we started going on this, this run. And we got to the top of the hill, all the way back. But when we started coming back, I started thinking, this would be pretty cool if I can beat my brother on this run back. And I'm, as some people here might know, I'm a little bit competitive at times. And so, and as a younger brother, it always feels really good when you beat the older sibling. 
And so we start coming back, and I start picking up the pace. And I'm just slowly trying to put the pressure on to try and wear out my brother. And I can feel him breathing heavily and behind me, and I'm thinking, yes, I'm going to beat him, I'm going to beat him, I'm going to beat him. And so we're running along, and I can see the end in, 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 I can see where the end is. And so I'm like, let's do this, let's put everything into this. And so I'm running, I'm running, I'm running, I'm running, and then I start sprinting. I'm almost there, I'm going to beat my brother, and I get to that final corner, and I turn around, and I suddenly realize that I forgot about the last hill. And there's about a one or two hundred meter hill left, and I see that hill, and I've just, my legs are burning, and my heart's puffing, and I've, I've just suddenly used up all of my energy. And I start to run up this hill, and my legs are like jelly. And then my brother, whoosh, straight past me. And when I was in that situation, when I saw that hill, was my spirit willing to run up that hill? I wanted more than anything to make it to the top. But was my flesh able to do that? It wasn't. And so that's what Jesus is saying. He's saying, Peter, the spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. Did Peter want to make it all the way to the end? Did he want to be committed to Jesus? Was he serious when he said, I am committed, I will even die with you, Jesus? But did he know what the course was that lay before him? He didn't realize the extent of the temptation that was before him. And he didn't realize that he was weak in his own flesh. His his spirit was willing, but his flesh was weak. And how did Jesus, what was Jesus, um, how, how was he going to overcome that weakness of flesh? It was through prayer. Peter thought that he was committed, but he wasn't connected. And because he wasn't connected, he wasn't committed. Peter wasn't committed to kneel with Jesus, and so he wasn't committed to stand for Jesus. And the same is true with us. If we're not committed to kneel with Jesus, we'll never be committed to stand for Jesus. Let's finish off the story, and we're going to turn to Luke chapter 22 and verse uh, 56. Luke chapter 22 and verse 56. And we're now going to read what I think is one of the most emotionally intense passages of Scripture. Luke chapter 22 and verse 56. It says, Then a servant girl, seeing him as he sat in the light, remember the flickering flame, and looking closely at him, said, This man also was with him. But he denied it, saying, Woman, I do not know him. Denial number one. Uh, and he, and, oh, okay, verse 50, 58. And a little later, someone else saw him and said, You also are one of them. But Peter said, Man, I am not. Denial number two. And after an interval of about an hour still, another insisted, saying, Certainly this man also was with him, for he too is a Galilean. But Peter said, Man, I do not know what you are talking about. And immediate, immediately while he was still speaking, the rooster crowed. But take note of what, hap- what it says next. It says, And the Lord turned and looked at Peter. And Peter remembered the saying of the Lord, how he had said to him, Before the rooster crows today, you will deny me three times. And he went out and wept bitterly. While Jesus was there being mistreated, while he was there being falsely accused and beaten, The rooster crows and Peter has denied him for the third time. And Jesus, from that point, he looks down and he sees Peter and their eyes connect. And when Peter looks up at Jesus, he realizes that Jesus has heard every single one of those words that he has said. And Peter, heartbroken, realizes that he has failed his Savior. He races out and he falls on his knees and the the Bible says that he wept bitterly. There's a quote from one of my um, favorite authors in Desire of Ages, chapter, um, verse, uh, page 710, and it says this. It says, Never was a criminal treated in so inhumane a manner as was the Son of God. But a keener anguish rent the heart of Jesus. The blow that inflicted the deepest pain no enemy's hand could have dealt. While he was undergoing the mockery of an examination before Caiaphas, Christ had been denied by one of his own disciples. Did you pick that up? It says that while Jesus had suffered, was suffering unimaginable things by the hands of his enemies, it said what tore the most upon his heart 
what gave him the biggest blow, inflicted the deepest pain, was that his disciple Peter had denied him. And this makes me ask the question, what pain have I brought upon the Savior? And Peter looks into Jesus' eyes, and he sees the most terrible pain, but he sees also that it's mixed with the most infinite love. And he runs out and he weeps. And the, the most beautiful thing about this passage is that even though Peter denies Jesus, Jesus doesn't disown Peter. That night, Jesus was still falsely accused for Peter. Jesus was still beaten for Peter. He was still mocked for Peter. He was still spat on, whipped, allowed nails through his hands and through his feet. He was still allowed himself to be separated from his father for Peter. Jesus still died the criminal's death upon the cross for Peter. And in John chapter, John chapter 21, when Jesus has resurrected from the grave, he intentionally seeks out Peter to reveal to him that he is not re- rejected. To reveal to him in the words of Paul in, John, in Romans 8.38 that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to, things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all of creation will be able to separate Peter from the love of Jesus Christ. And nothing will be able to separate us from the love of Jesus as well. Peter was so willing to disown his Lord, but Jesus never disowned Peter. And so today, you might be wondering, how does this story impact my life? How do we, how do we, how do we apply this story of Jesus to our own daily walks? And I have a few suggestions. Firstly, there might be someone here who, who like myself, has had times in their life when they've gone under the radar, when they've gone undercover. And maybe you haven't denied Jesus with your words, but maybe you've denied him with your actions. And so maybe this this message for you today is an encouragement to, to be more open with your faith, to be like John and be an open disciple of Jesus, and let your friends know who you are and what you believe and who you love before you get put on that that difficult spot where all the eyes are focused on you and no one realizes that you're a follower of Jesus. Or maybe you're someone who's made lots of commitments to Jesus in the past. We often sing these songs that we are so committed to Jesus and we'd give everything to Jesus. But then, so often, we find when the trials and temptations come, we continually fall short of what God would have us to do. And we find that just like Peter and just like me when I was going on that run, that our spirit is willing but our flesh is weak. So maybe for you today, the challenge of this message is to recommit yourself to getting down on your knees. Because when we commit to getting down on our knees, we're making the decision to being empowered to stand for Jesus. Or thirdly, maybe you're someone like Peter who was just absolutely overwhelmed with guilt. He realized that he had denied his Lord. He realized that he had caused incredible suffering to his Lord Jesus Christ and his friend from the last three and a half years. And he went out and wept, wept bitterly. Maybe there's someone here in that situation where we, are, we realize that we fall short of where God wants us to be. And maybe the message for you today is simply to realize that Jesus, even though we so often deny Jesus, Jesus never den- denies us. And Jesus' grace and his love is always large enough to extend to us and into our lives. And so I want you to think about those things and how you are going to apply this sermon. So again, I, I invite you to think about how this story of Peter and the failings and the, of Peter, how does that impact your life today? So whether you, you want to make a decision to be, to, to be more open with your faith, whether you want to make a decision to be on your knees more regularly, or whether you want a decision to realize that near the cross, we find that we're never rejected and that Jesus' love always extends for us. Um, We're going to have a a short, silent prayer, so just bow your heads and just a time so you can pray in your own heart to Jesus, however the Spirit is moving you to respond, and then I'll finish up with the final word of prayer. Let's pray.
Dear Father in heaven, so often we have caused you grief, Lord, through the way that we've denied you. Maybe not with our words, but even just with our actions, Lord. And Father, we ask for your forgiveness, Lord, and we know that it's there on offer for us because you extended it to Peter and you extend it to us. We thank you for your unconditional, inexpressible love and gift that you've given us upon the cross. Thank you for the comfort of knowing that even if we deny you, you've never denied us, Lord, and you're always there, um, there just pouring out your love upon us. Lord, help us, be, help us to actually be open in our faith, Lord, because sometimes we might say, yes, we want to be open, Lord, but our spirit might be willing, but our flesh is weak, and so we pray that you would strengthen our flesh, Lord. May we have the spiritual strength to overcome the temptations. Help us to be watchful, and instead of sleeping, help us to pray, Lord. And Lord, we just pray that, that you will continue to guide us and continue to lead us along your path. And we pray that you will take us all the way home into your kingdom. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.